Okay, so welcome, officially welcome to everyone uh, to this Coexisting with Coyotes program uh, in, uh, in partnership with the Woonsocket Harris Library. I'm Mary Gannon from the Rhode Island Division of Fish and Wildlife, and with me today you can see on our field cam is Gabby DeMailon with Kyle Hess and Numi Mitchell uh, from the Narragansett Bay Coyote Study. Um, so Gabby uh, is also with uh, Fish and Wildlife with me, co-running the Wildlife Outreach Program. Uh, Numi and Kyle have been studying coyotes uh, all across the state. I won't steal their thunder. I'll let them uh, you know, explain their research and what they've been up to. Uh, but we're very, very excited that uh, the Division of Fish and Wildlife has been able to partner with the Narragansett Bay Coyote Study uh, for this awesome research. Uh, so before we jump to the field uh, with Numi and Kyle, um, I just wanted to give just a, a quick overview just of what we do at the Division of Fish and Wildlife so you can see how uh, their work fits into the grand scheme of things uh, in our division. Uh, so here we are, here are your hosts, uh, myself, Mary Gannon, Gabby DeMailon, uh, with an awesome mallard, and uh, Numi and Kyle uh, with a coyote, which we will be tracking a coyote live today uh, with them in the field, which is very, very exciting. Uh, so our job at Fish and Wildlife is to protect, restore, and manage our wildlife populations in their habitats within the state of Rhode Island, and that takes many forms. We work with many different species. Uh, we could sit here for three hours and talk about uh, all the projects that we're working on, uh, but we work primarily um, with game species uh, as, as a huge part of what we do, and we'll talk about uh, why hunters are so important and game management is so important in just a second, uh, but we also work with non-game species as well, like bats, like salamanders, um, like uh, all sorts of songbirds. Uh, so there's always something different going on at our division. And um, our whole goal is to protect our wildlife populations and making sure that everything's in balance. Uh, so that's where the management piece comes in. So making sure that there's not too many of a particular animal and not too few. Uh, so things that come to mind like deer, deer management is a huge part of what we do uh, because in some parts of the state, people may say, oh, where are the deer? And then in other parts, they may say, can you please take the deer away <laughs> because there's so many. Uh, so finding that right balance and, and working with the public um, to gather data about our wildlife is very important. Uh, another huge, huge part of what we do is protecting habitat uh, for our wildlife. So Gabby, I'm going to unmute you guys uh, if you want to talk, um, talk about our wildlife management area system. Um, Absolutely. Um, so uh, normally, in a normal year, Mary and I would be going around to classrooms, around doing presentations all over the place. And one of the first things we ask is, what do you think we do at the Division of Fish and Wildlife? And we always get the answer, oh, well, you help wildlife. And that's true. But a lot of times people think we help injured wildlife. We bring them in and we help them get better and release them. We do train wildlife rehabilitators at the Division of Fish and Wildlife. We help um, license them, but we actually keep wildlife healthy in a different way. So we do want to make sure our populations are nice and healthy, and we do that by protecting habitat. And so you can see the map on the slide. Those are our management areas um, across the state. So we protect over 60,000 acres of land um, in Rhode Island on over 25 state management areas. And what's so important about protecting habitat is that we know all things need food, water, shelter, and space to survive. So space is a huge one. That's where all the food, water, and shelter is. So we try to protect these really large chunks of habitat, and we wanna make sure that we avoid habitat fragmentation. And that's when a habitat is chopped up into tiny little pieces by things like roads and houses and neighborhoods. Um, we wanna make sure that all the habitat is nice and connected so that the animals don't get injured and they have plenty to eat and stay nice and healthy. Um, so we do have, like I said, management areas all across the state. You may have been to Big River or Arcadia or our office is at uh, the Great Swamp Management Area. Um, if you do wanna come, we allow hunting, hiking, fishing, all in our management areas. Just make sure you wear your orange because it's just about hunting season. The second uh, Saturday in September it starts, so you need to make sure where your fluorescent orange. And Mary's gonna talk a little bit about how hunters help us protect habitat. Awesome, thanks Gabby. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, a, 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 we highly encourage everybody to check out a wildlife management area, especially um, during this time of, you know, we're stuck at home and uh, they're really beautiful properties and, and we, um, we work hard to, to care for them. So we hope that you get out and enjoy them. Uh, so. But why are hunters so important to, to what we do at the Division of Fish and Wildlife? It can be kind of counterintuitive to some people. Wait, don't you save wildlife? Why do you allow people to hunt wildlife? Um, 
And it really, uh, it's, again, it's all about balance. So we, um, at, at the division, we regulate all of our hunting regulations, uh, all of our seasons, uh, all of our bag limits, so the number of animals you can take in a season. Um, so for turkeys, uh, for example, uh, it used to be only one turkey per hunter in the spring. Uh, now we allow two because um, turkey populations have expanded so much that they can support um, a, a harvest of two per hunter. And that's all based in science. All of those bag limits, all of those season limits, that's all based in science. Uh, we don't make those decisions without being informed first. Now, the, the thing that most people don't know about hunters is that um, hunters actually fund the vast majority of the work that we do at Fish and Wildlife uh, through the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. And this was um, enacted in 1937 with the Pittman-Robertson Act. And basically what the Pittman-Robertson Act did was it put a tax on firearms, ammunition, and archery equipment. So this is an excise tax, which means that the manufacturers of those items have to pay that tax. Uh, so whenever you go out and buy a bow, a set of arrows, a shotgun, um, any, anything that you're gonna be using to go out and hunt uh, or target shoot, like Gabby and myself, we don't hunt, but we love to do archery uh, just, just for fun. Um, so anytime you buy those items, you're contributing to uh, wildlife uh, restoration and conservation. Uh, so that could be, um, through habitat uh, acquisition, uh, through research and monitoring, uh, like our Coyote Project uh, is paid for uh, through Whisper Funds, Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Funds. Uh, so it's really exciting that we're able to partner with hunters and sport shooters to be able to support this work. And we've been doing this for over 80 years to be using this program to fund wildlife conservation. This has helped uh, protect millions of acres of habitat across the country. Uh, it's helped to uh, gather a lot of information about our wildlife um, and help us to make better decisions for the future of our state's wildlife. Uh, the great thing about it is that even though it's aimed at game species like birds and mammals, uh, so turkeys, ducks, geese, deer, uh, coyotes, um, it also helps uh, non-game birds and mammals as well, like bats, uh, like songbirds. Uh, things that require uh, different habitats. Uh, so if we protect the wetland with the idea of providing hunting opportunity for uh, waterfowl hunters, that's going to protect everything in that wetland, whether it's turtles, whether it's dragonflies, whether it's rare plants. Uh, so this um, program has been a huge, huge uh, success for our wildlife across the country. Uh, we're very excited to see where it takes us in the future. So with that, while Numi and Kyle are uh, honing in on our coyote, I'd like to start us out with a little bit of Coyote trivia. I love trivia. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, so I, I just want to test everybody's knowledge a little bit before we get into our fun field work. So I want to ask everyone um, to type your answers in the chat. True or false, the coyote is native to Rhode Island. It's a native species. It's been here since the dawn of time. So we've got some answers floating in. Okay, so we've got kind of a mixed bag here. We've got, how many people say false? So one, two, three, four, five. So we've got about five falses, two trues. Okay, a couple false true. <laughs> so, so we're all over the place. All right, we can get a virtual drum roll for our answer. Oops, we go, maybe. There we go, it is false. So if you answer false, you are correct. Uh, coyotes were first spotted in Rhode Island in 1960. Uh, so it took them a while to get here. Uh, and the reason why they're not native lies in uh, this map here. So if we look at the dark orange, this is the historical range of the coyote. So they're originally from the Great Plains and from the West. And as uh, the European settlers arrived on the East Coast, they started cutting down forests, they started, um, eradicating predators. So our natural top predators here in Rhode Island uh, to start with were the gray wolf and mountain lion and black bear. Uh, so when the settlers got here, they wiped out all of those predators. They did not like large predators because they were fearful uh, for their livestock and for their own safety. Um, so the problem with 
eradicating those predators and pulling them out of the ecosystem is that you open up uh, a niche or a job in the environment. So that job description of top predator was not being filled. It was wide open because we lost our large predators here. Uh, and as people started moving west, they built railroads, they built farms, uh, they kept moving west and the traffic from east to west uh, started picking up and we had people going out in covered wagons uh, out west. And as people moved west, they started dumping their trash. They started um, leaving things behind. And coyotes are very opportunistic, which Numi and Kyle will be talking about uh, later uh, in the presentation. Uh, so as, as the coyotes started seeing these new opportunities for food um, with those trash heaps from all the humans moving back and forth, they started expanding their range. Uh, so we started seeing coyotes moving up uh, through the north and the southern United States. And they ended up here in Rhode Island in the 1960s. Um, so they're not technically an invasive species. Uh, when we think of a non-native species, a lot of times we think of an invasive species that causes problems uh, for others. Uh, coyotes are what we'd call a range expansion. So they just kind of spread out uh, throughout their original range and they're filling that niche that was left open by the wolves. Uh, so they're not really damaging anything in our environment. They're just filling in uh, that space that was already open uh, and that's a natural, a natural place for them to be. Okay, next trivia question. What do coyotes eat? Let's type in our answers in the chat. Let's see what happens. Okay, I'm seeing our trash, pretty much anything. Trash, small animals, rabbits, trash, turkey, lost trash. <laughs> Whatever they can find. Mice and rabbits. Any other answers? Carrion, small game, really anything they can get their paws on. Absolutely. So coyotes, you are absolutely correct. They eat pretty much anything and everything. Uh, so they'll eat a lot of small mammals like mice and rabbits. So they're great at controlling uh, rodent populations. Uh, they'll eat things like stray cats uh, because they don't distinguish uh, between a stray cat and a rabbit or a woodchuck. They're about the same size. Uh, looks, looks like a good size meal. So they'll go after uh, stray cats and also your pets too. Uh, so it's important that we keep an eye on our pets, uh, especially at night uh, and keeping making sure that you supervise your pets so you go out and help greatly reduce um, this, this area of conflict with coyotes. Um, deer. Uh, coyotes will actually take down deer uh, if they are given the opportunity. Uh, here in the east, our coyotes form packs, um, and they're a little bit different uh, than the coyotes out west. Coyotes out west are more solitary. They're a little smaller. Um, as the coyotes expanded their range eastward, they started to um, hybridize a little bit with wolves and picked up some wolf genes. So our coyotes here in Rhode Island have some wolf genes. They're not direct hybrids. They're not what you would call a koi wolf um, because that would be a wolf and a coyote mate to create a koi wolf. These guys are way down the line in the generations. Um, so they don't, um, they, they aren't direct descendants of wolves, but they have some wolf genes that allow them to um, form packs and to take down deer. Uh, they'll take things like geese, they'll eat things like chickens, if you've got backyard chickens, you probably know this, um, but they'll also eat things like berries and fruits. Uh, if you have an open compost pile, if you have uh, uh, fruits and veggies uh, growing in your garden, uh, apple trees, these all attract coyotes uh, because they're omnivores. Uh, they're not strictly carnivores, so they'll eat both plant and animal material. And of course, they'll eat trash. Uh, very fond of eating trash. So my last trivia question before we head out into the field, how much do you guys think coyotes weigh? our eastern coyote. Let's type our answers in the chat. 30 to 50 pounds, 15 pounds, 45 to 60 pounds, 75 to 85 pounds, 20 to 30, 25 to 35, 30. Feel like an auctioneer. <laughs> All these numbers coming in. All right, so our answer is 30 to 50 pounds. Um, so a little bit heavier than their, their Western cousins, um, but uh, my, my very roly-poly Labrador weighs about 65 pounds, so much smaller than, uh, than my dog. So I think we'll take a minute and we'll head out to the field. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can get a nice big uh, focal video.
for um, Numi and Kyle. Let's see, so we're just going to unmute you guys. So we're unmuted. Oh, oh, sorry. There we go, now yeah, we're unmuted. <laughs> All right. I'm going to mute myself so you guys can uh, have the floor. Hi. We're at the Providence Police Mounted Command. That's why there are horses all around. And the coyotes that we're tracking really like it here. It's a peaceful place. The horses are used to them. And so they rest nearby in the sun. The, the coyotes that we're tracking are urban coyotes, but they're expert at finding any little bits of habitat that are in the city. And these coyotes have connected pretty much every piece of brush and, and and parcel of forest there is to be had. And around Roger Williams Park Zoo, where the Mounted Command is, is a pretty substantial uh, open space area with a lot of brush and natural habitat. So in the daytime, we find the coyotes here quite frequently hiding in the shrubs just out of our line of sight. Um, we know the coyotes there because right now we're, we're getting a position on her with the radio, and I'll turn up the volume a bit. Can you hear that? Okay. So what we do is we play hot cold with the antenna, and we look for the place where there's the, lo the loudest signal. So I'm going to turn it down because it's not really distinguishing it. Okay. Very quiet. Louder. getting quiet again. So right now I'm getting her over at the far side of the horse path. Hear how loud that is? And she's, you would never know she's there if you didn't have a radio caller on. Because people here at the, at the barn are completely unaware some days that coyotes are all around them. And indeed, this one is named Winnie because we caught her here and because it's a horse pattern, and it helps us remember where we caught it. We also caught a coyote we call Champ, and a coyote we call Nicker. But Winnie is uh, a mom, uh, an alpha female, we call her, and she has had three puppies this spring. And so we've been following her since just about December 1st, and she's taken us all over the city of Providence. And the thing that's really neat about Winnie is she, as I was saying before, manages to find the real habitat, the coyote habitat, in the middle of the urban area. So she crosses some of the busiest sections of Providence in order to get to the other good places, which are over by the windmills that save the bay. And so we chase Winnie all over the city. Normally we have, a, we just use uh, signals from a GPS caller that texts us, believe it or not, her position. And we have very intensive maps of where she's been ever since we caught her. Do you want to show some of those maps, Mary? Or should we walk around to where Winnie is? Yeah, absolutely. So let's, um, I can just show a map really quick um, as you guys are walking. And then once you get there, if you want to let me know. That sounds um, good. All right. <laughs> So our plan, Mary, is um, they're going to go around this side of the paddock, okay. um, walk all the way around with the radio transmitter, and I'm going to go around the other side um, over here, and they might um, push the coyote out, so it may run by me. So we're going to say. We're going to go with you. Oh, you're going to come with me. Good. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> One thing about a plan is it's always subject Perfect. to change. You can go first. Okay. All right. So, so I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn down your volume, Mary, so that we're nice and quiet. Okay. Um, so I may not be able to hear you just for a couple of minutes. Okay. We're sounds good. Watch for Kyle's signal. So I'm going to just um, remove you guys from the spotlight video, and we'll share our screen so everybody can see. Um, everybody can see uh, Winnie's points and kind of see an aerial view of this. So let's present this so everybody can see. So we're loading. So here we have um, the city of Providence and here's Winnie's points. So we can see all of these blue lines and red lines and dots and oh my gosh, this is crazy, right? So um, what Numi and Kyle uh, do is they'll take a look at this map after they've collared Winnie 
and um, they'll look at all of these lines and all of these clusters of points. And the clusters of points are telling me and Kyle where Winnie's returning and where she's spending the most amount of her time. So she keeps coming back and forth to these spots over here, these spots over there. Um, and, and she's really making her way around the city of Providence, right? So Numi had said she's crossing all of these busy streets. This is all just a, a neighborhood, just a gridlock of streets as she's going back and forth. But she seems to really, really love Roger Williams Park the best. Um, and her points where she's um, gathering the most, so we can see all of these uh, blue points, we can see all these red points. The blue points are showing us um, her nighttime feeding points and then we look sorry at Mary do you want to do you want to spotlight our video just in case Ooh, we get yes. um, okay absolutely <laughs> so in case we get the coyote so we'll stop sharing and we're gonna spotlight everybody here there we go because he's uh he's making his way so we'll see to let you know this never works because they're not on the payroll. <laughs> Kyle's over on the other side over there. I don't know if you guys can see him. She is. There she is. Did you guys see her? It's a little blurry here. Oh. Do you guys get to see her? She was a. It was a little blurry, Gabby. Oh. I heard her. Oh. I heard her feet though. I heard her like running. She ran right, right by us. Well, just, oh. <laughs> <laughs> just to put this in perspective, sometimes we'll let him go. And we won't even see them for the next year. They're so invisible. So that was actually a big score, you guys. <laughs> so you've seen Winnie. And her <laughs> even puppy, just barely. <laughs> her puppy's in there. Yeah, just barely. And her puppies are in there, too. We can give it another try, but she's clearly moving along this area. Um, where, how, what would you like to do, Mary? So, Numi, uh, do you want to just give us a, like an idea? Because we jumped right in. So, folks, normally we would like kind of formulate a story here, but when you have live animals and you're tracking them, you got to go with their schedule. So, <laughs> so we had to do a little bit of tracking first, but Numi, let's just backtrack a little bit. If you want to explain um, just the, the process of, of capturing a coyote, um, and <laughs> you've got a friend there who's very not, he's not camera shy at all. Uh, <laughs> if you want to just um, explain the process of trapping a coyote um, and and why uh, why we're tracking them. Um, and I can share my uh -huh. screen so we can see some pictures from actual uh, trapping. Okay, well, since coyotes only got in this area around, oh, the, 
end of the 80s, early 90s. Um, people had a hard time getting used to the fact that they were here. And, um, and a lot of folks were nervous and also they clearly were, they clearly were increasing in numbers. And this, we started working on the islands and on Aquidneck Island especially. Um, the Aquidneck Island, they uh, um, uh, were, went from basically zero to people seeing coyotes all the time in the streets in over a period of, of uh, five, five years. So what we did was we tried to explain, there's a little current in there, we tried to explain why um, they were getting so abundant. And one of the things we knew going in was the more food there is, the more coyotes there are because they have more puppies. If a coyote is getting fed a lot, um, she'll, she'll have as many as seven pups. And if a coyote is sort of scrapping for food, scraping for food, she might have three. Now in this case, Winnie's scraping for food a little bit and the max number of pups she had was three that we know about, possibly a fourth, but three. And so, um, so what we've been trying to find is where they're getting their food resources. And very interesting about Winnie is she's figured out everywhere in town to get the easy takeout food. And right next to this horse paddock, right over the hill, there happens to be the maintenance area for Roger Williams Park Zoo. And in that maintenance area, there is a garbage skip where all the garbage from the zoo goes, french fries, burgers, you name it, it all goes in the garbage skip. And there's a ramp that goes right up to the top of the garbage skip. When I say skip, it's a huge container that the trash guys come and roll on and roll on. And um, so, hey bud. <laughs> He's very happy. You head on out because you're distracting. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> he's really, he's really <laughs> happy to be there. <laughs> he's a very friendly horse. He's very friendly. I think his name is Riley. And um, so, uh, so what we found right away, and Mary can maybe show you the maps, is that it, at nighttime, at nighttime, there were a ton of points over at the garbage skip. skip. And so she uh, made that a critical part of her territory and she visited it all the time. The other coyote, one of the other coyotes we trapped named Champ, he doesn't live in this territory that she occupies. He lives to the south. But because of that garbage skip, skip, he still sneaks into the area and tries to get a piece of the action, so to speak. So we do feel that the garbage is actually subsidizing the coyotes. And we find so many things like this all through our study and we realize that coyotes aren't the problem if they're getting numerous. It's really people. We need to change our behavior and make sure everything is packaged properly. If it's trash, it's got to have a lid. It's got to be wildlife proof. And if you have big resources like compost piles or you're a farmer who's uh, getting rid of anything from squash to dead sheep parts. Sorry about that, but it's the reality of farms. You're going to be creating uh, a lot of coyotes because um, more food, more puppies. Awesome. So Numi, let's, um, I want to give folks a chance to, um, to ask some questions. So maybe if we want to type some questions in th into the chat before we kind of um, move on to the next portion of our, our okay. presentation. So and before we do a couple questions, um, so this map um, that I pulled up as Numi was talking, you guys can see this is that southern end of the little peninsula at Roger, Roger Williams Park. And there's the, the trash dump. Uh, so all these blue points are where uh, Winnie is going and getting a nice little free snack uh, out of the trash. And you can see these red points. This is where she's resting during the day. So all these nice, um, nice. brush and uh, all the bushes. Uh, that's where she goes and hangs out during the day to hide, uh, just like she was uh, in, in our uh, trail chase there, I'll call it. <laughs> so I'm going to stop sharing so we can uh, bring up Numi. So if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to type them into the chat and we'll, we'll take a few minutes to, to ask some questions. All right. Sounds good. We're, um, we're just heading back to see if we can maybe find her again. Kyle 
um, has that radio trans uh, uh, receiver and he is going to walk ahead and Yumi is ready for, for questions as yeah. they come up. Yep. Does anyone have one? Um, let's see, we're just waiting. So we're waiting. Okay, so uh, Mary is asking, do the pups stay with the mother? Uh, so Numi, how long are those pups going to stay with her? Um, ah, you know, um, well, probably about till September and at the latest November for most of them because as they start to grow up, uh, they turn into kind of teenage coyotes and they start to um, give their mother and father, who are the alpha male and female of the pack, a little pushback and they can get irritating so just like <laughs> sometimes it's good for kids as they grow up to get out of the house that's what happens to coyotes um, and right around september october november they are starting to figure out uh, if they're going to stay with the pack or go find another place to live now most of them leave if you have seven coyotes in a pack probably five of them will um, take off due to friction of, with the parents or maybe, you know, just a, a wanderlust. Uh, and the coyotes that are left are usually uh, very go along to get along animals and they become the babysitters next year. So the answer is the really good mama's boys and girls <laughs> will stay with the family group to take care of next year's puppies. But most of the pups will disperse right around September or October. Awesome, thanks, Yumi. Uh, so we have a couple other questions here. So Bill asked, uh, how is the estimated population in Rhode Island today compared to five years ago? Um, the, I don't know any hard answers because it's very hard to estimate there's a plane going on. <laughs> the jet. <laughs> So it's very hard to estimate numbers of coyotes because you usually do that as a biologist by uh, catching them, marking them, letting them go, and then recatching them. But coyotes are way too clever to ever get caught again. So it's very difficult to count them. But we do get a sense of it from our motion activated cameras. One of them is right up here. And we've been monitoring this area for a long time. And Kyle said to me that this is this tree right here is right where you you caught yeah, Winnie the first time? Yeah. Right here. And um, actually, that was Champ. He oh, Champ. Up a little time. Yeah. But yeah. So we've been monitoring this family group as they pass by here, and we try to get a count. Usually, we find three to five animals in a pack. But if times are really good, if there's a huge uh, livestock pile of, uh, you know, dead turkey feed or chicken parts or things like that, you can get a lot of coyotes staying with the family. So you'll get a higher density. So the question was, what does it look like now? Um, there are more family groups than there were, but the density of each family really can depend year to year on what they're able to uh, appropriate to eat. And if they're only eating natural food, the three to five members of a normal pack will be spread out over maybe seven square miles. But if they're getting subsidized by food like turkey feed in a farmer's compost pile or something like that, it could be very significant. And they'll reduce their territory to two or three square miles. And what that does is it makes room for other families. Each family keeps the next family out. But if there's a resource like that, everybody kind of crowds into it and splits up the territory because there's plenty for everybody to eat. But that means that instead of just having three to five coyotes in a seven square mile area, you now have three to five coyotes every three square miles. And what that does is it increases the density of coyotes. So on a year to year basis, actually, coyote numbers can go up and down, but you can vary I, we believe from our data, you can very easily manage coyotes just by reducing these sort of freebies um, that they find in the environment that aren't natural foods. If they're eating mice, geese, um, uh, squirrels, and woodchucks, they're going to be in lower numbers because those things are hard to, to catch. So, in fact, if they're uh, working for a living, 
it's gonna they're gonna take they're gonna have to have a larger territory. But it, if they're getting easy pickings, as I was saying before, from a compost pile, they don't have to work at all. So um, that's that's the dynamic. Does that answer the question a bit? Yeah, I would say that's that's pretty good. Um, you want to show the camera over yeah, here? Yeah, quickly while we're we'll by it. So another thing to note too is that um, you know coyotes are a game species, so they can be hunted and trapped legally um, within season, and you know following uh, proper regulations. Um, and there's certain types of traps you cannot use, um, so you can't use uh, leg holds or snares or anything like that. Um, no poisons. Uh, so we we highly regulate uh, the the method of take. Um, but as Numi is saying, you know we could we could hunt all the coyotes, but if you're continually supplying them with food um, in these in these little hot spots, um, that's not going it, to, it's not going to balance out. You know, you could, you could continue to hunt the them. The other thing is in them Providence them. like this. Oh, she did. <laughs> the other thing is in Providence like this, how would you ever hunt? Because exactly. you've got little tiny, uh, you've got a fragmented landscape as you were talking about earlier and coyotes are masters of using it. And also from the, from the difficulty we've had pinning down a coyote and seeing it, even though we had the handicap of having a radio tag on it, you can see how hard it is to get a glimpse of and try to even think about managing coyotes by hunting them. So mostly hunting is good for keeping coyotes afraid of people. And that's sort of what we really want. It's good for the coyotes and it's good for people. It keeps them out of neighborhoods and protects pets they might encounter if people make the mistake of letting the pets out unsupervised. Right. So Numi, we have um, another, we got a lot of questions here actually. Um, so, uh, so we've got a question, what should we do at home to help coyotes? What can we do at home to help coyotes is the question. Oh, look around your neighborhood and see if anybody's feeding, if there are any food sources around. Because at this time of year, the puppies, and in fact, one of Winnie's puppies is very, very tame. And I am sure, and Kyle is sure, that we're, that someone is feeding them. And uh, what happens then is, uh, while the person that's feeding them uh, thinks the animal's really cute, which of course it is, um, and it's a harmless situation, that puppy's going to grow to be a big, you know, athletic coyote who's a predator. And now you have a tame predator that's patrolling around neighborhoods. So what happens is usually the coyotes have to be taken out by police or something if they're what we call habituated. So you're doing a favor. What you can do is make sure your neighbors don't feed puppies, that you don't feed puppies, that you don't put out any food or nobody else in your neighborhood puts out food that might train coyotes to come forage in town. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so we have another question. Oh, this is one about um, about Winnie's pack. So is it the whole pack that's roaming the city together? Um, so what's the dynamic of the pack and the habitat? Uh, so I, if Winnie is, is ranging all over the place and we saw her crossing all those roads, are those puppies following her? Well, they did recently because yeah. they got here. We were kind of surprised. Before she was going on her own, and, uh, but now they're big enough to follow right across. Can you imagine? I was saying earlier to Mary that it reminded me of make way for ducklings. <laughs> because if you have uh, the mom coyote trailed by her litter of three going through the densest inner city sections of Providence, uh, it must be quite a sight. But at least it's probably in the middle of the night. All of the lines, you'll see the lines of travel in Mary's map. And the long lines that cross the city are almost always dark blue, which means she crosses the city with her pups, if she's taking them, at night. But the male and female frequently divide up uh, the jobs. Sometimes the male will be hunting, the female will be staying with the pups. Sometimes both the male and female want to just get out by themselves and hunt. And one of last year's pups, generally called a beta, like a the alphas are the top animals, the betas are the next down. So the betas will stick around and babysit. So there doesn't seem to be, they don't always seem to travel together, but that's where their howling comes in really useful. Because if they find something neat uh, somewhere in their travels, they can 
they can howl and bark to tell the other pack members, come over here, we got something really cool here. So that's, they're always in touch, almost always in touch, but they don't necessarily travel together. Uh, Numi, we've got, we actually, we have more questions. Oh, I love all these questions. This is great. Um, so let's go back to Numi. Uh, so we have, let's, let me just scroll up to the top of my questions. <laughs> uh, so apparently Kyle, Kyle says uh, that when he is, is down, down by the water, down over there. Yeah. Okay. Can we show them, Kyle? Yeah. So she was down there, and by the time I worked my way down there, she turned around and worked her way back over here. Can you, the turn that signal towards fade out right there. Yeah. Okay. Here. Uh, or you can turn it towards the camera. Wow, she's like right in front of you. Yeah, so she sounds like yeah. she's... Oh, she's over there. Oh, yeah. She's definitely very close, but we still can't see her. Yeah. And this is a good point to make too that, you know, a lot of people are afraid of coyotes and we're hiking in the woods and they're saying, oh my gosh, if that coyote is that close and I didn't even know it was there. Um, but she's not coming out to be aggressive. She's not coming out to be inquisitive yeah. towards people. Um, most coyotes and most wild animals just want to be left alone. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you're out hiking, you know, if you're, if you're nervous of encountering any, um, any predators, um, I mean, Gabby and I are out in the woods all the time, Kyle and Umi out in the woods and it's you know they only are encountering the predators because they're tracking them and they're getting up close to them you know when i go out in the woods i do not see anything because <laughs> because the animals are like i will keep my distance uh, i want to be left alone um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind um you know we don't we don't show you this to to freak you out um but if you are nervous about you know if you've got coyotes in your in your suburban neighborhood and you're, and you're nervous, you see them a lot, uh, if you're walking the dog, um, you know, just making lots of noise and being as big as possible, um, scaring the coyotes. Uh, we tell people make a coyote shaker, to, so you take a soda can um, and empty it and put a couple pennies or some pebbles in it, tape the top of it with some masking tape and you can shake it like a, like a noise maker and it is very loud um, and it can startle them um, if you're if you're not confident in your shouting abilities or if you don't have a pot or a pan uh, with you on your dog walk. All right, do we, do we have another question, Mary? Yes, we do. Uh, so, uh, so we have the, the whole pack. Um, are, uh, so are you guys tracking any coyotes anywhere other than Providence? Yes, we're tracking them all over the state. We've got one, well, let's see where our animals are. We had an animal in Matunic. We've got one in East Providence, right across the river from us. And, um, and let's see, so we have Champ, who's down in South Providence, Cranston, which is interesting. We just got uh, data back from uh, Trifle. She's a coyote out in the wilds of Green, Rhode Island. And she's a very interesting one because she has mostly all wild habitat, except there's a farm on one part. And so we've discovered that there's a huge resource for her family there. So we're gonna be working with that farmer to clean up his livestock pile and we're gonna see what happens. And uh, so what all these packs we hope will show us is if we can clean up all the extra food resources, just like the coyotes I explained, their territories shrink when they have a lot of food availability. They don't wanna leave that food because it's a pot of gold, but also um, they don't need to be. So if we take the food resources away, and this is our experiment, we're gonna clean up all the old turkey feed and the, the cow carts and things like that to get into farmers' piles. And then what we should see, what we're predicting, is that the territories will expand and the density of coyotes therefore will get less. And so it's gonna be really great. We've conducted this experiment a number of times anecdotally. This is the first time we're actually going to work with the farmer to manipulate the resources, get rid of all that stuff, and, and then see what happens. So we predict, as I said, larger territories and 
as food or if they can't battle their way to a larger territory because there's coyotes everywhere pushing back. Anytime a group wants to expand to get more mice and more geese in, in their territory when they've lost a big farm dumpster pile, um, anytime they try to expand their range, there's pushback from the other coyotes all around. So sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. If they lose, now they have too many coyotes in too small an area to support the family group. So what happens? Coyotes get kicked out. And those coyotes wander around, and we call them transients, and they look for another place. Sometimes they find it, sometimes they don't, but a lot of times they get hit by cars trying. So in a way, you know, it's the way naturally the population is gonna balance itself based on the amount of food resources available. So that's how we think it's gonna go, and we hope it does. Okay, so we have lots more questions. Oh my gosh, so exciting. Um, so uh, about the, the map, um, the question is, uh, so those lines that are crossing over the ponds in Roger Williams, um, oh. so are those, those lines, they're not swimming. Those are just like... Well, the they do cross on the ice, remember? Oh, that's right. Part that's, right. Here, that's frozen. But no, there's two hours between each point. So the, the line, it just to indicate the general uh, sequence of points. Uh, it doesn't mean they ne necessarily cross the water. If it's water, they could go around the pond in two hours and hit their next point. They don't have to go straight across. So yeah, we're just connecting the dots. That's what it's just like. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, another question is, so um, from Pam, Pam says she has a horse farm too. Are the coyotes eating manure? Do you think they're, they're snacking on any horse manure? It depends if there's the sweet feed in there. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, they love candy as much as the next guy. And so if the horse isn't digesting its food properly, there's a chance that that would happen. But having had horses myself, I have a couple of horses and I have never had that happen that I know about. Okay. Um, another question, uh, two questions actually. So do they mark their territory um, like other animals and how long is the lifespan on average? Ooh, okay. So the lifespan, should I start with that first? The lifespan should be as long as a dog, but life's a little bit harder for a coyote. And they have, they don't get wormed like dogs get wormed and they don't take heartworm pills. And so generally after about four or six years, coyotes are, have pretty well worn out. They usually have a lot of parasites internally and they're in a weakened condition and, um, they, you know, that's probably getting towards the maximum normal age, six. Okay, so the other question was? Uh, the other question um, was, do they mark their territory or how do they mark their territory? Oh, definitely. They have a double, they doubly do it because they mark areas on the outside like dogs do. How, how do dogs mark? <laughs> do you? You know, they pee <laughs> on everything. With Let's stinky stuff. <laughs> yeah, they, they use urine to say, this post is my post and it's on the edge of my territory. And when you take your dog on the walk, he pees on all his posts to let all the other dogs in the neighborhood know it's his. Coyotes are the same way, but you also know that the dogs let other dogs trespass within that boundary. But you know that you're in the serious part of a coyote territory when you see scat and scat is droppings and that a coyote scat means this area or this thing is mine and this is something we found over the years they will mark sometimes if there's a dead deer uh, that they have found and they're going to eat it they'll put a scat on it to mark it mine and they mark the inside of their territory with scats at all the entry trails so that when other coyotes hit that scat, they come and run into it. It's a signpost to them that says, pack, uh, Winnie's pack is saying, stay out. If you come past this sign, this scat sign, we will attack you. And so that's how the territories are maintained. And then someone asked, what does the scat look like? Ah, <laughs> good question. Um, it can vary. <laughs> but it's a lot like dogs, but it contains a lot of fur. 
what Kyle thought he had if he was there, but it contain, generally they'll be furring it from woodchucks, squirrels, uh, and voles, uh, little meadow voles, it is their favorite thing to eat this time of year. If we see any, we'll show it to you. <laughs> we find them. So while you guys are still looking around, um, I'm going to, I would love to share uh, a video that Numi um, shared with us, uh, one of your trail camera videos of Winnie meeting up with her uh, mate at their den. And it's, it's possibly one of the most adorable things I've ever seen on a trail camera. Um, so uh, Numi and Kyle will set up the trail cameras to keep an eye on their collared coyotes and their activity. Um, but uh, what they'll also, what we do at um, Fish and Wildlife, what we've been uh, able to do is um, we've been able to set up trail cameras in conjunction with URI, uh, the uh, Wildlife and Conservation uh, Genetics Lab, uh, which is really exciting. So we've been doing uh, a study uh, on bobcats in particular and black bears uh, across Rhode Island by setting up camera stations um, at those little, those little research stations where we're either trapping, uh, live trapping bobcats to collar and release or um, to pick up bear hair samples on little pieces of barbed wire. Uh, so we'll set up something smelly in an area and the bears will theoretically walk by and snag some of their hair. Uh, so the genetics lab can uh, determine individual uh, bears based on their DNA, uh, which is really exciting. So I, they found that lots of different things walk by these cameras. So we did um, a little extension of that study by doing a um, just a general mammal trail camera um, study. So by setting up I think there's close to a hundred cameras that were set up and they, uh, the, um, and at URI, we had uh, our partners at URI uh, in the genetics lab, but also uh, a bunch of their uh, undergrads who were amazing volunteers and, um, and doing all of this uh, on the ground work and sorting through literally hundreds of thousands of trail camera uh, photos. So setting them up on the western side of the state and then setting them up on the eastern side uh, to get a bunch of different uh, footage and, and pictures of all sorts of things. Um, so trail cameras can give you a lot of insight into uh, an animal's life and, and just presence and absence uh, in, in certain areas. So if we're seeing, you know, coyotes constantly run by uh, a certain trail camera that's sitting there for a couple of weeks, you know that they're, they're there. Um, so this is uh, the video and hopefully it won't be too choppy. Uh, so there's the mate wandering in and this big brushy looking thing is the den. And he's gonna go inside. Oh, and there's Winnie. You can see her collar, that little box on it. And she is very excited that he's home. <laughs> Look at her tail going. Uh, so I could play that again if, if folks wanted to check that out again in case you missed it. Very excited. Um, and you can see in that video uh, that um, that Winnie's uh, tail and her mate's tail are very, very skinny. So uh, Numi said that they both have uh, mange. So this is a, a common uh, a common disease in uh, wild uh, animals in the dog family. Uh, mange, it, it can be fatal, um, but a lot of times they can fight it off as well. So just if you see a coyote or a fox that it looks like the fur is kind of falling out and it's a little a little messy looking, uh, most likely it has mange and it can be, it can be severe. Okay, so we're gonna unmute uh, Numi and see what is going on. Okay, so Gabby, what's going on out there? Hi. Sorry, I just went, I went for a quick run. Um, so they're trying, they found Winnie again. She is down by the water and um, they're trying to push her to come back up this way to see if we can get another peek at her. Um, so keep your, your eyes peeled, she may right. run. We'll keep you on the focal video. <laughs> yeah, so I can't see her from where I am now, but they're coming around. So I'm just gonna be really quiet and see if she'll come. Numi's right over there. Kyle went to the other side over that way. And this is, I think, where her trail cuts through. You can see where she went through this little bit of a trail. I 
I heard her earlier when Newly was um, speaking. I heard her run by us just a little ways off. And he's all the way down there by the water. So while we're waiting, I can... Um, Kyle just... said when he went down the other way with the radio transmitter, the uh, the coyote was was very close to him. So okay. should have followed him, but you never know where they're going to go. I know, you never know. I can see him all the way down there. So we've got a couple of questions. Oh, here. Some, oh she's coming. She oh, right by it. I can see it move through the brush, but it's much better. There it goes. Oh, it's running along the edge of the water. It's too far away. Oh, no. So, yeah, we should probably heard you and went, oh no, <laughs> or smelled you and said, nope, I'm not going over there. She ran right by Numi. I saw her go right by her. All right. All right. So while we're waiting for Numi and Kyle to rejoin us, we've got a lot of different questions here, uh, which is great. So uh, we've got a question, are coyotes watching us during the day and we don't know it? Um, yes and no, you never know. Uh, so uh, if you're over here at the at the mounted police uh, stable, then maybe they are. Um, out in the woods, I would say, you know, if there's a brushy area that they could be hiding out, uh, maybe. Um, but that, that could be true of any animal. Um, most, most animals are really, really good at hiding. And uh, as we said before, they don't want to be bothered. Um, so the, the quieter they stay and the, uh, if they sit still and not draw attention to themselves, then uh, they're not spending energy trying to get away or to, um, to uh, interact with, with humans. Um, so we answered, what does the scat look like? Uh, so another question, how did coyotes get to Jamestown? So uh, believe it or not, they actually cross the bridge. <laughs> they walk across the bridge. Um, you know, there's not as much traffic at night, uh, so they can, they can saunter right over. Um, another question, do, does Rhode Island have melanistic coyotes? So melanistic, uh, for folks who don't know, that just means that uh, the coat is entirely black. Um, so al albino would be entirely white. Um, so yes, so we do have, we have a variety of colors uh, in, in coyotes. Um, we've gotten pictures from folks, uh, completely black coyotes. We've seen uh, blonde coyotes. Uh, we've gotten pictures of thing, uh, coyotes that are a little bit reddish. Um, stereotypically, a coyote is more gray with a little bit of brown and black uh, mixed in, um, kind of a brindled sort of look to the fur. Uh, and even on those trail cameras, like I mentioned before, that URI uh, partnership study with the trail cameras, uh, there's tons of pictures of coyotes. And uh, one that I saw on the, on the camera uh, that they had sent over some of the best shots, uh, there was one that was almost all white. Uh, and she was like cream white and kind of blonde. Uh, they have beautiful green eyes. Uh, so there's a lot of variation um, amongst individuals and they're just so, so beautiful. Uh, so the largest coyote recorded in Rhode Island, that's a good question. I do not know um, the answer to that. Uh, we could ask Numi um, to see what, what the record on, on weight is for the coyotes that she's collared. Uh, but uh, Gabby, do you know the answer to that question? That might have to that may be a question for Yeah, uh, we'll just catch up with Numi right now. So they just, they just emerged from the woods and we can ask them. I did, we, we couldn't see her. I could see her, but I thought she went right by you. Right yeah, down the edge of the water. Yeah. Yep, about eight feet away on me. Yeah, so, yeah, she looks okay. <laughs> She's a little bit mangy because, um, and we also think this is a density dependent disease. It's a mite that coyotes tend to get when there are too many coyotes. So, we may have, it may be good to lower their numbers for that reason. But when we caught her, she was quite, quite furry. And um, I think you have a picture of her. She's a beautiful coyote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we just had, Mary was just answering a couple of questions while we were waiting for you guys to come back up. And one of them was, what is the, the largest coyote in Rhode Island? Is that, is that right, Mary, what the question was? Yeah. Well, the largest one we've ever caught is uh, 52 pounds. That's it. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, so I wanted to, uh, so we're kind of coming up, we're at 2.30, um, so I don't want to take up everybody's uh, full afternoon, but we want to thank you all so much for 
uh, for joining us. I do want to share my screen uh, one last time to um, bring up, oh, if I can get it to switch to the next slide, uh, to bring up um, just some, some resources for you uh, so you can connect with us uh, online. And here's a, a picture of one of Winnie's puppies uh, that Numi sent us. Um, this week. So a super, super cute little guy. And I think there's a second one hiding back here somewhere. Um, so you can connect with us on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, you can also check out the very awesome resource coyotesmarts.org. So this is um, a product of the, the Narragansett Bay Coyote Study. Uh, it has a ton of resources on coyote natural history, on um, things that you should do to prevent coyotes uh, entering your yard, or what to do if you see a coyote, uh, ways that you can report coyote sightings. Uh, in the chat, I will also add in um, a link to a resource that um, uh, Sarah Riley, our implementation aide at Fish and Wildlife, she sits at the desk, she takes all of the calls uh, that come in about various uh, wildlife issues, um, and she, based on all of the calls and the volume of calls that she's received about coyotes, she put together a really nice um, resource uh, that's a, a decent length uh, about coyotes and uh, summarizing all of that information together. Um, so if you know um, anybody who would be interested, you can share that with them. It's just a, a PDF online. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, and it's also just- one other resource, Mary. Oh, um, there's um, Narragansett Bay Coyote Study. And we have um, a map online of all the coyote reports we've received. And we've received them from Edmonton, Alberta. We wow. received, but most, for the most part, it's Rhode Island coyotes. And you can click on dots and find out who saw what where. And it's kind of neat. There's photos associated with it as well. So um, we try to post that as much as we can. We've been busy lately, but it is a really cool map of the entire United States with coyote sightings. So that's at Narragansett Bay Coyote Study. Just Google that. I'll put that link in the chat as well. Um, that will link you to that. And I just put in the document from DEM as well. Um, and of course, if you have any additional questions, feel free to uh, contact us um, at any time. Uh, and you can, you can find all of our contact info um, at, at the DEM website and also um, on the Narragansett Bay Coyote Study. So I'll just pull up that slide one more time so we can end Oops, with that maybe can we say thank you thank you yeah so thank, thank you, you so much uh thank you numi and kyle uh thank for you us today uh we really really appreciate uh you taking the time to to spend with us in the field and take us on an exciting uh run through uh the the um the wilds of providence there <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much thank you. Mary. all right everybody all right, so we'll um, we'll end the meeting, or folks can uh, just uh, trickle out as they as they uh, as they will. And thank you guys so much, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. All right, thanks, everybody.